All right, good morning, everybody. So this is going to serve as some recordings of the lecture notes that were unable to be recorded through Microsoft Stream since they've been sort of acting fussy on Canvas for me. So I wanna make sure that I did my part and give you all a synopsis and review of everything that we looked at for our PowerPoint notes. This section is going to cover just the introduction and basics for the executive branch as we start working through unit two. As we explore the executive branch, the first thing that we really want to highlight is that Article 2 of the United States Constitution formally states the powers, requirements, and duties of both the president and the vice president. In the executive branch for Article 2, the key job of any president, and that includes the vice president and their support staff, is to enforce laws. Now, to, again, reiterate, it's not just one president, it is an entire branch, which includes, again, all people who are employed in this branch to enforce laws. So again, that includes the vice president and of you know, recognition, the president's cabinet. As we look at the hierarchy or the chain of command for the executive branch, the president will serve the highest position as a citizen of the United States elected by the population of the United States. The vice president will, of course, serve as a support figure and is also a person who will be leaned on if the president becomes ill or incapacitated or unable to do their duties as president of the executive branch and the United States of America. Underneath these two critical positions, we have the cabinet, which is formally put together of about 15 departments, and these official departments are full of advisors and other support staff who will help guide the president or vice president in leading the entire country. Beneath the cabinet, we have other critical regulatory agencies, uh, commissions, and positions that also help oversee the enforcement of laws and the protection of the United States and its people. Every single president on their day of inauguration must first formally take an oath of office, and that oath is where they are recognizing the duties that they are being given. They're recognizing the chief job that they are going to undertake as they lead the American people and help protect the United States Constitution. As you can see in that last line there, defend the Constitution of the United States. And we also appreciate that that includes the citizens, even though it doesn't formally state the citizens, the people are what make the Constitution a living document. To be president, an individual, either male or female, must be a natural-born citizen of the United States, meaning they were born on U.S. soil. They must be at minimum 35 years old, and they should have, read, must, have lived in the United States for a consecutive 14 years leading up to the actual election. Some of the major benefits that any president will enjoy while they are in office is that they will make a salary of $400,000 per year. They are given a significant series of other expenses and monies in order to do their job effectively. They are given residency in the White House, and they are also given residency in Camp David, which is more of a sort of recreation leisure home that they may also use to entertain foreign dignitaries or members of the state. They also are given a very significant number of assistants who we'll talk about later on. They are given, of course, 24-7, 365 days of the year protection from the Secret Service, which will carry over for the next usually 10 years to life for the president. And they are given very high quality medical care, which is going to be on the spot at the White House. Some of the other major benefits the president will receive, we earlier mentioned that they have a significant staff, and that staff will go anywhere from four to 1,800 people, depending on which group you're looking at in the White House. Part of their staff will, of course, be protection for themselves, their loved ones, their members of their team through the Secret Service, which, as many of you know, Secret Service was initially created to defend the U.S. Mint and the Treasury, but... Now we have assigned a detail to the presidency and many members of Congress and the Supreme Court will also enjoy protection from Secret Service. We had discussed in class the benefits of transportation and we know that a president will move quite frequently as they represent the American people, both domestically and from a foreign perspective. 
usually we will see, <clears throat> excuse me, the presidential motorcade, which most foreign heads of state will also have. And the motorcade is a very complex system to make sure the president arrives safely for all meetings and opportunities to work with the people and the representatives of the people. When flying, the president has two other modes of major transportation very, very consistently in the life of the president is the support helicopter, Marine One. And for those very long distance travels, the president will use Air Force One, which will be the chief way the president will move, especially traveling internationally. However, this plane will also be used domestically too. We watched a very unique video on Air Force One, which opened your eyes to what the plane is capable of doing. As far as how long the president will serve this office, based on the 22nd Amendment, each president who is elected will serve a four-year term, which they may run for two terms. This is largely based off of the number of years that President George Washington ran when he was technically the first president of the United States. We have seen in the past moments where this situation has been modified or changed, such as example FDR, who ran for four terms, because the country was in a major conflict with World War II. However, after that, we have seen, because of the 22nd Amendment, every president being limited to only two terms, each set at four years, for a grand total of eight years of office. When choosing the president, the president will be elected using the Electoral College system. The Electoral College system is broken down as a major connection back to the New Jersey and Virginia plans during what led to the Great Compromise in our Constitutional Convention. How this system works is quite simple. Based on every single state's representation in Congress, each state is granted electors. The number of electors is based on every single state's actual number of representatives in the House of Representatives and the Senate. This again is at the federal level, not the state. However, these are state representatives. For example, we look at the state of North Carolina, North Carolina has 15 total electoral votes. Two are going to come from the two senators who represent North Carolina. The remaining 13 are the number of representatives in the House of Representatives for North Carolina, coming out to a grand total of 15. A presidential candidate who wins the popular vote of the state will typically win the total number of electors and electoral college votes that are then used in a grand system, if you will, to identify who the total winner is for the Electoral College. The candidate who receives the highest number of electoral votes, or the one who hits 270 votes first, is going to be the winner of the presidency. 270 is the magic number that we place because that represents more than half of the actual electoral votes for the country. So typically, the candidate who gets 270 first will be the winner. This does have some controversy. Typically here, we recognize that the popular vote is just the total number of votes for the entire country. The electoral vote is the number of electoral votes that a candidate wins when they work from state to state trying to get elected. Therefore, we can see this turning into sort of a strategy. The candidate who focuses solely on just the electoral vote may not be campaigning enough in other smaller states with a less significant electoral vote count. So your states like Montana or the Dakotas, for example, with only three electoral votes, may not necessarily be given as much campaign time as your bigger states, like California or Texas or New York or even North Carolina. So there again is the controversy. If you can win the Electoral College, you win the presidency, but you may not win the popular vote. Such examples of presidents who have won the Electoral College vote but failed to reach the popular vote are listed for you here, and there are a few of them. Most recently, of course, is President Donald Trump. Prior to that, Republican President George W. Bush. So we can see that sometimes these presidencies can be mired in controversy. Did these individuals just play the game and not focus on winning the hearts and minds of all citizens? That raises a very significant question. So when we look again at the Electoral College for the 2016 election, we can recognize based on the map, the states in red are, of course, states that went Republican and voted for Trump versus the states in blue that voted for Hillary Clinton. She only gained 232 votes, whereas President Trump did surpass the 270 rule and therefore was given the title of U.S. president for 2016 to 2020. 
in the 2020 election. We will see who will win versus President Trump versus candidate Joe Biden. It will be very interesting nonetheless, as you can imagine. But with that being said, that is the end of the introduction notes for the executive branch. If you have any questions, reach out. Happy to help in any way. Thank you.